Hi there, I'm your host John Iverson and as usual I'm joined by Marcella Monroe who is a principal at Macmillan Vantage and Andrew Balfour who is the managing partner at Rubicon Strategies. Uh, so we've had a chance to digest the election result. The parties are turning their thoughts to what comes next. So does Justin Trudeau's trip to surfers paradise have an enduring impact on his future? Can Aaron O'Toole weather the criticism from some members of his caucus that he blew this election? And does Jagmeet Singh emerge unscathed from the accusation in some quarters that he's too lightweight? So, Marcella, was Trudeau's decision to skip the National Day of Reconcilia uh, Truth and Reconciliation that his government introduced in favour of a beach holiday, was that overblown or do you think he's justified the criticism that he received? No, I don't think it was overblown. Um, you know, he continues to try to tell us how important this reconciliation is to him and the relationship with Indigenous people. And then, you know, this first day that his government has asked us to recognize and to contemplate our relationship with Indigenous people, he takes a plane to a beach holiday like it's completely ridiculous and i don't blame people for being upset i personally was was really upset i mean we were just days out from him winning a minority where he should have understood that it was a time to be humble and to focus i, I look i don't i don't blame anyone for wanting to take a break but that he couldn't wait 12 or 14 hours to go to tofino uh is is really ridiculous and hurtful and it also just speaks to, I think, this underlying feeling that a lot of Canadians have uh, that he isn't what who he says he is most of the time. Uh, and I, I, you know, I was hearing from liberal colleagues even who were so frustrated and felt, you know, they were exhausted from campaigning. They had donated money to the party, and just right out of the gate, he kind of reflects what it is about about himself that Canadians don't like and can't relate to, and so. Um, I think, you know, the, the Liberals are in a minority government almost despite him at this point. Uh, and I just hearing him apologize again for how many times has he had to apologize for this kind of stuff. Uh, I just think we're, we're kind of become numb to it, which is really unfortunate. Yeah, I, I mean, I do wonder what would have happened if it had come before the election. It does seem to confirm people's views that he's that he's out of touch. Uh, he is a repeat offender when it comes to making inexplicable decisions. The mea culpa's do sound half-hearted. I mean, I do. I honestly do believe that um, that he believes his own publicity. That he's own, that uh, because he has good intentions, that excuses his lapses in behaviour and decision making. Um, you know, I do think there are domestic pressures around him. Uh, I understand that. I think that uh, everybody needs a break. Uh, but this was a highly symbolic occasion, and if anybody should understand symbolism. It's Justin Trudeau who's built, this has been a cornerstone of the whole Liberal government, um, you know, quite frankly, often at the expense of, of substance. So I, I thought it was a, a, a pretty key moment. Uh, I do wonder whether um, he will be the man or, or leader to take the, the Liberal Party into the next election, because, you know, these, while people may tolerate more from Justin Trudeau than they tolerate from just about anybody else, there is a limit. And it seems to me... He's pretty close to breaking that limit. What do you think, Andrew? Does he lead the Liberal Party into the, another election? I would suggest probably not. He has been around now for six years. This government will last for, my guess, two to three. Um, maybe not. Um, he, I, if I, you know, I will never be prime minister, and we should all be happy about that. Um, Absolutely. But, uh, you know, I wouldn't want it if I had that job. Dog catcher, I think, would probably be the extent of your organizational power. Right. But, uh, you know, no people don't stay in this job for that long because it's hard. Um, you know, if by the time the next election he'd be have been prime minister for eight, maybe nine years, I mean, that's a long run. Is there pressure? To, is there pressure for him to recognize that fact? I don't think that there's pressure. Um, I don't think that there's like you know caucus outrage or anything. I mean, we saw some members of the Conservative Party come out and speak against Aaron O'Toole, but we haven't seen anyone like go to the media about Justin Trudeau from the Liberals. So, and 
But we we all know they are talking about it, well, and that's how so they feel. So sorry, I, that's what I was about to say. Like, I, I, <laughs> as a liberal, I understand that we're very good at being unnamed sources, but uh, you know, the, there aren't a lot of unnamed sources right now. So that would indicate to me that right. there aren't, the knives are not out. Marcella, let's turn to uh, to uh, Aaron O'Toole. Um, how do you think his standing has been affected by by this week's caucus meeting, and public criticism from some MPs that the uh, the party is now more hom homogenous, more rural, less likely to break into the, the big cities than it was before. Well, I think it's it's look, it's, it's very true that <clears throat> conservatives once again find themselves debating each other about who they are and what they want to be when they grow up, um, and it's it's not a great look. And I think it's you know personally, I think it's ridiculous for knives to be out at all for Aaron O'Toole at this point, when it was kind of clear from the election that you know this conversation that started before the election within the conservative community about what do they need to do to be seen as a governing alternative again. Um, had barely really taken shape. And then you have an election where he does try to pivot to talk more to some of the suburban voters they need to talk to again, and then gets tripped up because they somehow hadn't quite come to terms with issues around gun control um, or childcare, really. You know, their, their positions on those things became muddled and so kind of lost ground, but they haven't really completed. You, you can't say that his view of how to do this didn't work because he didn't really have the opportunity to follow through. And so it seems to me now that if you want to build a modern conservative party that can actually form a government, you need to continue that conversation. And the fact that what's happening now is they're going back to square one of having this constant debate um, about, you know, whether or not they're conservative enough, quote unquote, uh, is quite ridiculous. But it is rather fun to watch. <laughs> the, I mean, the, 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 uh, the party told me that their, their own exit poll, which was 10,000 people, so pretty, pretty comprehensive, suggested that the number one reason why people who were considering voting conservative did not actually do so was because they didn't know enough about Aaron O'Toole. So it does suggest that uh, that he's still kind of in his salad days as leader. And, and um, I mean, I thought the party did okay uh, in the circumstances. People didn't know who he was in the first few weeks, um, but he persuaded people he was a serious candidate. Uh, they were mistakes. I mean, I, I, I can't explain how they lost three seats because the Chinese community didn't turn up. Um, you know, that was just uh, just bad campaigning. I think I think why he did. I was in Richmond with him one time. We were in Richmond. We went to by bus to Port Moody Coquitlam, where he held a press conference against a black backdrop. The candidate was there. He didn't even introduce the candidate. The, 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 the event could have been anywhere. And we drove back to Richmond without doing an event in Richmond. So, you know, there, there were some schoolboy errors when it came to, to the campaign. I think they also, sorry, but just it, my knowledge of the Chinese voter and community in Canada, they vastly underestimated how critiquing the way the conservatives were full on against the Chinese government, it's, it just doesn't work with the Chinese community. Because even if the Chinese community agrees that there's problems with China, they, they really don't like being lectured about it by, by, by non-Chinese yeah. politicians. And so, you know. I'm sure that, that that was an element to it, but but I mean, in that event, given the fact you hold three seats, you would think you would try and explain your position a little bit more. Um, you know, obviously they lost huge ground in in rural Alberta and rural Saskatchewan. You know, twenty points in some ridings, although those candidates still won. I mean, that seems to me, you know, they lost three seats in Alberta, but they still won all those seats, and I think they didn't explain to that constituency again what they were trying to do, that they were essentially trying to appeal to non-partisan voters who might be, uh, who might be turned to, to vote Conservative in the way that they had been in, uh, in the Harper majority years. But having said all of that, their vote share increased in six provinces. They won more seats in four provinces. And even when you look at seats like Pickering Ux Uxbridge, which they lost, you know, the candidate there, Jennifer O'Connell, won with 51% of the vote in 2019. Uh, 23 points ahead of our Conservative rival. This time the differential was just nine points and her vote share was down and the Conservative vote share was up. I mean, to me, all of those things spell progress and, and a kind of worrying trend line for the Liberals. I mean, Andrew, what do you think? Do you think that the, first of all, the, the, the caucus has passed this Reform Act provision? Is that in any way important? And is the caucus upset enough to turf them? I don't think that they're going to turf them. I don't think that that's on the table but the reality is like 
you just said, you know, it went from 23 to 9. Well, winning by 9 points is still a pretty good margin. And they have, like, one of the people keep trying to say that this election didn't change anything because they just look at the core number of seats in the House. This, like, the Conservative Party of Canada doesn't hold a single urban riding east of Winnipeg. They, I'm exaggerating a little bit. But, um, and the Liberal Party doesn't hold pretty much any rural riding. Like, that did change. There is a massive kind of country city divide at this point in time in our politics, like much like back in the 90s. So things did change. And, you know, I know I don't think that Aaron O'Toole is going anywhere. But I mean, if we think back to many, many years ago, I mean, they kept Joe Clark around for a while before they just gunned him. So maybe Aaron O'Toole is fine for now. And if Justin Trudeau or whoever his predecessor might be is still prime minister in three years from now, maybe they gun him at that point. Let's turn quickly to the NDP then. Uh, uh, Andrew, I know you're not a big fan of Jagmeet, but as a Liberal, you should be happy that he's going to get another kick at the That's can. That's not true. No? I don't have a, a personal issue with him. I just, the fact that he's still on his campaign stump and I have to still listen to him tell, tell me that he's going to fight for me and 22 votes and all these random things that he just kept saying over and over and over again on the campaign and he's still on it. Like, it took everything in me to not throw something at my TV watching his press conference today. Like, it's just like, okay, that didn't work. You spent $25 million. You got no, like, no seat gain. Like, maybe try something different. How about that? Marcello, we've touched on this before post-election, but um, are you hearing anything about a rebranding for the leader? I mean, clearly, he is likable, but he couldn't convert that into votes. Well, it was it was interesting listening to uh, my former colleague Anne McGrath talk about this this week, um, because she definitely has a clear sense uh, of what what else they need to do, uh, and of, of where they should go next. And I was kind of <laughs> my startlement today at uh, Mr. Singh's press conference was was. Did he listen to what Anne had to say about it? Because, like, she no. was kind of crystal clear about, you know, where she saw the challenges for the party and, and what they need to do next. For the benefit of those who didn't hear that, what did she say? I mean, basically, she said uh, several interesting things. You can listen to the Hurley Burley podcast to hear the whole interview. But, you know, her, her main thesis, and it's one that I find uh, hard to disagree with, is that, you know, basically, um, the the voters, what they were finding anyway in their research is it's that he is very well liked, and we know that, but that voters were essentially um, quite concerned, having just come through COVID, uh, that they would somehow uh, lose lose ground, I guess, if there was a massive shift one way or the other in government. And so they, you know, decided to kind of go with the devil they did know. I mean, she, she didn't put it that way, but that's what I took from what she had to say. And so, you know, there is a point that Andrew makes that I think is quite right in the sense that he needs to get off his election hustings. Probably didn't help that he had the sniffles today, so maybe his head's a little cloudy. Um, but I think there is some room to maneuver uh, to pivot the message to be, okay, you know, we've heard from Canadians loudly and clearly. And so now going forward, here are the two or three priorities that we are going to make you know, front of mind as we go back into this minority parliament with the Liberals. And I would have just, honestly, day one, I would have just been focusing on childcare, um, where I know the Liberals uh, say they're determined to follow through, but we know they're going to get stuck with some of the provincial governments. And there's an opportunity there, I think, for the NDP to continue to push that issue. So they need to be much more crisp, I think, on the issues they're choosing now that now that it's been decided by the people who's in the House. But I mean, I, you, know, you know, I traveled with him and, and, and it was refreshing to see the rallies and it was great. You know, he, he got off the plane in Halifax and climbed on a longboard and skated around the tarmac. Um, you know, we had some time in Dartmouth and while the TV guys did their stand ups, he was doing handstands and walking around. I mean, I, I thought it's all great and it was very refreshing after the cynicism of the liberal and conservative campaigns. But people are electing a prime minister. And um, it does strike me that, that uh, he needs to be a little bit more prime ministerial, as a, you know, to be a serious contender. And that sense of um, gravitas is, is missing. Is that something you think that uh, they're aware of or working on? I, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's research to, to back that up. That's certainly something that columnists and other pundits have been saying. 
<laughs> I'd like to see the research that says that that's indeed his Achilles heel. Uh, I'm, I'm not so convinced. Um, you know, and, and look, I mean, the other thing is we, I mean, it's the, the, the rubric has shifted a bit, but Trudeau back in the day before he was prime minister, this was the main complaint about him was that he wasn't serious enough. So, you know, I don't, I don't know that that but, sticks but he, with the he, voters he put, necessarily. He, he put away the skateboard. I mean, he, he actually brought a skateboard into the House of Commons one day and, uh, you know, he turned up in jeans and stuff and, and he put that away. And I think that that was a prerequisite to getting elected as prime minister. So we're, we're out of time. So we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, guys. We'll uh, chat again next week. Thanks for coming out. Cheers. Thanks.